So yeah, firstly, congratulations on season two. I think you guys have absolutely knocked it out of the park. It's fantastic. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much. So Gotham's gone through quite a sort of transformation recently. Um, you've gone from kind of a crime noir to sort of a gothic horror sort of thing. Um, what can you tell me about the introducing themes of kind of resurrection and monsters and all that sort of thing? How do you feel about that? <laughs> I mean, I think it's incredible. I, I think like it's opened up this whole new uh, avenue of storyline that we can exp you know explore. And I also re I'm really excited about the the, the monster aspect. Uh, and and the first thing that comes to mind is actually Fish Mooney's return and how she now has this this superpower. But really, it's 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 a bit of a departure for the traditional Batman storyline, as far as I I know, in the sense that Batman has always seemed to be rooted in reality and within the confines of you know the laws of physics yeah. that we all exist under. But now that we've introduced this new aspect, I think it's a really exciting you know it's a really exciting. Uh, area that we're going that is somewhat uncharted, so I, I'm thrilled about it, personally. Sort of expertly executed by the wonderful BD1, mm -hmm. I have to say, yeah. Tonya. You know, that whole idea of the Jacob's Ladder thing I found terrifying. Mm -hmm. And that's really a thing, interesting thing about our, sort of our show, it, it, it does sort of metamorphosize, it changes constantly. And just finding in sort of an underbelly, another, another sort of undercurrent to, to our show, I thought was extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of, the, one of the most exciting parts of it is that it offers frankly, a threat to the villains. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, you know, having these creatures that are unpredictable and unknown so that it's going to force us uh, to have alliances against them or to uh, cause other conflicts between villains in conquering this other thing that's almost threatening our rise. Mm. It's also from an acting standpoint, it's kind of it's kind of reassuring because now, <laughs> unless you're blown into a billion pieces, there's always a chance you could come back. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Like there's a little bit of job security there, which is nice, you know. Uh, that actually brings me on to my next question quite nicely. So going forward in series three, uh, what can you tell me about the recently resurrected Fish Mooney, and have we seen the last of Jerome? That's a good question. <laughs> we, we don't I have, know. We know very little. Very I little. mean. I we will we will know more very soon. I think, uh, I think that was ex I think that was really well executed. I have to say by our showrunners, the whole idea of, um, played by the brilliant Cameron who played mm -hmm. Jerome yeah, cool. um, was the, was the the idea of the cult of the Joker that it was yeah. punk rock. You know that the, the Gotham is descending. You know, it took a long long time to get to the bottom of the barrel before Phoenix like Batman rises. But the idea of the cult of anarchy, the idea of the cult of the Joker, I think was a very very clever uh, sort of slant on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, again, going, going uh, back to your characters. Well, I mean, when you were first cast in the roles, how uh, how much familiarity were you uh, kind of required to have on past incarnations of your characters, or were you just given complete free reign? You didn't have to have any prior knowledge, that sort of thing. Bruno Heller, the the creator and showrunner, gave us well for me personally. You know, we had a long uh, conversation after I was cast about um, what what does a modern Riddler look like. Um, However, we weren't starting there. What does a modern day Edward Nygma look like? Um, and, and who do we want that person to be? And he, he had an idea, and, um, and the thing he said, you know, while we were in season one, and I'm like, you know, still growing and creating this, this person who was kind of not, not significant in the first season. And he said, you know, I, asked, I, I, was, I kept asking questions of him, and he said, there was a point where he was like, well, you're Edward, so you tell me. Mm. And it was this allowance of like, oh, right, yeah, no, that is, that is me. And it, from that point on, there was just like an ownership to it uh, and, this, and the collaboration between the writers and the creators and, and myself felt so much more authentic once I was like, stopped asking questions and started just participating in a different way. Also, the brilliant thing is that when we auditioned, we didn't know what we were auditioning yeah, for, right. and, it, and the scenes themselves weren't. The characters had different names and all of this, and so that that we and that was the the full audition was that. And when we went in to read for Danny Cannon and Bruno Heller, that was the scene that we read, and it was just actually it was based on just that 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 was the characterization that we came in yeah. with just on our own creation. So from day one. There was freedom. There was an expectation to live up to the people who came before. It was very clear that this was going to be its own 
you know, it's going to be a, a, its own entity and, and it's and not really referencing what, what uh, again, the characters that came before. Yeah, us, so. yeah we were sort of given these generic uh, pieces, speeches. Um, and mine was about an East Ender going into, into a pub and breaking someone's larynx. And I had no idea what this thing was for, didn't even have a character name or anything. And it was only when I saw Bruno and Danny that we'd heard in the sort of, the, the sort of Hollywood ether that there was this pre-Batman show, this Gotham thing. I had no clue. And I said, well, what am, who is this? And they went, this is Alfred. You know, and that's how I discovered that the character I was reading for. And like you said, it's very interesting, actually, that, that, that's, that we actually were cast because of these generic pieces, so we were them before we actually knew that, that we were going to be the, either the Penguin or the Riddler or, or, or Alfred. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So, I mean, how did it feel when you found out that you were auditioned, when you did find out that the parts were for this Batman prequel show? I mean, were you fans of the comics or the movies uh, prior to the, to the series? Yeah, 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 I was a huge fan of the original one because that's the extraordinary thing after 76 years of mythology and everything like that. I mean, you know, the Adam West one everyone considers extremely camp, but at the time when I was a kid, it was super cool. And that's the thing <coughs> that it's always managed to change with every generation. It's been, a, it, you know, it's been um, part of sort of um, every generation's culture since its since its original birth. And that's the extraordinary thing about the, the sort of the legacy of the Batman mythos. When I found out it was, you know, a Batman story, and also that I was playing the Riddler, and and I had found out between my first audition and then when I went in to read for Danny and and Bruno. Uh, it was one of those moments where it kind of knocked the wind out of me. I was like, okay, yeah. And but then it was like, you know, I, I just took a step back and I was like, okay, no. The only reason I'm in this room is because what I what I did before. And so I was just like, I yeah. I really focused on on just being true to my original instincts, and then going forward. And thankfully, those instincts were correct. <laughs> the Batman that I I grew up watching the the uh, Tim Burton Batman with Michael Keaton. Um, Jack Nicholson. I, my brother and I watched that all the time, uh, but I, I didn't delve into the comics until after I was cast, and that was like easily the most helpful and most exciting uh, part of the process. Because at first I was like, oh my god, this is actually terrifying. <laughs> this is terrifying. This is such a daunting responsibility to try to like add to the mythology, you know? Because it's there's such a an audience for this, and like the the last thing you want to do is disappoint anyone. So, so there was that pressure. But when I was reading the comics, over you know the seventy-five years that they've been around, plus, uh, I realized that there have been so many incarnations of the Riddler. There, his personality changed. Uh, you know the way he was a criminal. Uh, the tone of his of his crimes were changed every time an artist or a writer came in. So I felt a uh, an allowance and freedom to kind of like do like Corey's version, which was nice. <laughs> wow, you do, you do it fantastically. So, Thank you. Uh, speaking of Tim Burton's Batman, I mean, you've recently had uh, Paul Rubin on the show yeah, as yes. uh, the Penguin's father, which of course was the role he played in uh, Batman Returns. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you know if there are any plans to have any more sort of callbacks to the past, like potentially Danny DeVito, something like that? I want that? Jim Carrey to play my father. <laughs> 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 That's what I would That'd like. Can we talk to him? Yeah, let's get him. Get him on the phone. <laughs> uh, I mean, I. Well, that would be delightful. I mean, I think we would all be like incredibly, you know, excited f about that prospect. I mean, again, like Corey, my intro to Batman were the Tim Burton films, and then of course when we found out that Paul was playing my dad, it was just like mind blowing, and and and, and just you know, I personally felt so honored that like the the crossover, the 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 first and crossover that we've had to the films involved, you know, the Penguin's yeah. father. It was just a, just a brilliant, cool. genius, genius. Uh, casting decision, yeah. so yeah, it was great. <laughs> I mean, um, in, in terms of your characters again, um, they, I mean, they already seem pretty close to their comic book counterparts. I mean, in terms of how they can evolve, where they can go from here, what can you tell me about going forward in season three? Like how they're going to further evolve and go down this, well, in some cases, darker path. I'm going to get really fat. <laughs> yes, look at you. It's already it's started. Uh, I think. Um, well, I think I think uh, there's the political climate in the United States right now is something we're going to tap into uh, in season three. There's a lot going on um, that is <laughs> quite quite Gotham esque, so we're just going to embrace that. Uh, I think for the Riddler, um, my 
my understanding is that, um, you know, well, where we have to go is he has to kind of accept the fact that what he's been doing, which is using riddles to terrorize people, he has to kind of claim that as his identity. And so that's where we're going with that. And once he kind of realizes, oh, this is who I am, this is my weapon, uh, you know, and to kind of like don that and don the question mark, then from there there's a sort of like, there's a like a final acceptance and then everything can kind of get more extravagant from there. Once he like claims his identity, then all hell breaks loose because he's, he feels like a solid person. So right now he's still kind of like scrambling around trying to find himself. For, for Oswald, I think, uh, you know, after this last year, having lost uh, his mother and then the loss of his father, and then also in between having been uh, somewhat, he's gotten sort of the, the clockwork orange treatment from Hugo <laughs> Strange, where he has all of, all of his malice and all of his, you know, uh, his, you know, violent impulses are wiped away, and he becomes, he, he became a very, you know, sincere, honest, you know, truly loving person. And yet the lesson he learned is even when he was that way, people still managed to abuse him and in, in essentially torture him. And, you know, I think through all of this going forward, I think this has just unlocked something in him where he can be, like, even more vicious, even more violent. Because honestly, if he doesn't do that, if he doesn't become the most, you know, the most vicious person in Gotham City, then someone else is going to come along and and try and, and rip him back down to shreds. And I don't think he's gonna ever let that happen again. A continuing theme of our show for all of these characters is the loss of love, you know, and how that affects a person. And, you know, in Oswald's case, having gone through it twice in this last season, I think it's, yeah, again, just, you know, it's going to allow him to be the monster that everyone thinks he is. I'm just hoping that Master Bruce actually listens to me. That's, that's, that's all I can hope for, really. <laughs> good no, luck. I think I th yeah, good luck with that. Um, um, I think that there's going to be a, sort of like an adherence. Um, it's hard to say because we haven't read it, but I have a feeling there's going to be sort of a more of a, a, an adherence with uh, Master Bruce and Alfred where they accept each other a little more. And there's going to be more involvement with uh, the brilliant Chris Chalk who plays Lucius Fox. So I think, you know, to counterbalance the evil which is exploding through Gotham, I think there needs to be an adhesion of Operation Good Guys. I think that's what's going to happen. I think that we're going to be slowly drawn together. Okay. I mean, how long do you think the series has the potential to run for before Bruce becomes Batman? Because, I mean, if, if it was to run for 10 seasons, that would take Bruce up to well, maybe he's, he's 19 when he leaves for Tibet. Yeah. So I think that's round about the time. So I think another... Five, five we, can, we can kind of like 15, play with Davids. Yeah. 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 Though David is <laughs> as mature as a thirty-year-old, he is uh, <laughs> in his mid-teens um, and more intelligent than. Yeah, he goes off to Tibet. Tibet. He's nineteen, uh, yeah. so I think uh, that's when the show ends. I think. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the the idea when the show started is the you know the final shot of the final scene of the final episode is the moment he dons the cape, because at that point our story is over, mm. which is, yeah. how does this city. You know, force Bruce Wayne into becoming a vigilante, mm. and then our story is done, and then it's picked up in the movies. The movies. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just finally, um, have you been keeping up to date with the the DC movies? Maybe you've seen Batman v Superman. Are you excited about Suicide Squad? I can't oh. wait for Suicide Squad. <laughs> yeah, I'm very excited for Suicide Squad. For uh, we were all at the Batman v uh, yeah. Superman premiere together, uh, which was an extravagant evening, and. Uh, you know, the movie is like sensory overload. Yeah. <laughs> it was, I, I, I really, I enjoyed the movie in so many ways, and in a way it felt like I was binge watching a, a whole other Batman television series. Like yeah. It really, it doesn't have, a, it didn't have a traditional arc as a movie does. It has like these peaks and valleys, and it goes and explores and goes down ways you didn't expect. Uh, I just thought it was brilliant. And then as far as comic book films go, I think Batman vs. Superman actually got closest to recreating the experience of reading a graphic novel. I mean, just in the sense that the way it was presented. Uh, yeah, I thought it was brilliant. Oh, that's great. Cool. Thank you very much, guys. Thank, Thank you. 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 Thank you